Please. Stay for it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, agenda tonight. Uh, lots of good stuff. We have a demo tonight by George on airbrushing. We're going to talk about the show. But before we do that, let's talk a bit about. There were two shows last weekend. Uh, the one in Windsor and Air CAD Con. Um, I managed to pop into Air CAD Con. Um, mm -hmm. From Paris, Ontario, I dropped my wife off at the yarn show, and then I was able to negotiate a couple of hours away. I know my uh, podcast colleague kind of did the same thing in the reverse. Beautiful, beautiful day for a drive. That's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Um, so I understand quite a few people in the club cleaned up on the awards wise. Anyone want to? Frank? Frank? Mike. Mike. <laughs> yeah, you cleaned up. Ronnie. Yeah. yeah. No, it was, it's a small show, but it always has been, but it's a good show. Good fun. A lot of amazing stuff on the table. So, anyone else have any other comments about it? Oh, yeah. I think the Zentradi died. Yeah, crashed. Yeah. Uh, collapsed. It collapsed or it crashed. Okay. I know, a rough night. Yeah, that's why. All right. Um, did anyone make it to the Windsor show? Dave, you were mentioning you might. The Windsor show, did no, you make it? No, okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Okay, keep it simple. Um, all right. So we, we're going to talk about our show. We have got, uh, Bill has kindly stepped forward. I didn't even have to like dab him or poke, poke him to uh, volunteer. There's several bills. Mm -hmm. Bill Dawson. Bill Dawson. Sorry, I don't want to give- Keeping you safe though. I, I don't want to give the other Bill a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> He's agreed to step forward. <laughs> I tried, I, I, I couldn't get a hold of your wife to volunteer you, sorry. Otherwise, I would have. Okay. All right. Just, just, just checking. Um, yeah. And it gets dangerous. Um, so anyway, Bill's generously uh, volunteered to come forward and become show chairman to help coordinate things. Uh, that does not mean he's doing the whole show on his own. Uh, so I understand we've got a couple of people willing to come forward and be on the show committee. And as I mentioned in my email, we have so much information from previous shows. We've got email lists, vendor lists. A lot of it's literally just A to B, in the calls, get the confirmation, booking the venue. Uh, Carling Heights becomes available as of the end of this month again for the assessment center. They're cleaning it up. So again, if, unless anyone else has something, I think that would be a good idea. But it's the show committee. No, no, that's not going to make you popular. Yeah, we can usually book a year out. So who else was interested? I know Peter, you mentioned it on Facebook. John's in. Oh, that's going to help. Gary? All right, there you go. So we've got more than enough more than enough people. Um, maybe if we can, Jeff, you can collect names because I'll have to. What I'll do is I'll assign rights to an e to a to the Google Drive, and we'll yep. pass stuff up. Um, Alan will be happy, happy to have you. Um, they've always come down and help with uh, help with, with, with judging. Um, one of the things I do recommend is fairly early in the process, try and figure out who's going to coordinate judging, just to start yet, because that's sometimes even on show day you're ranking wrong. Idea. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to look at something like, like, like that after seeing what a few other shows have done. I was talking to some of my podcast colleagues in the States about how they've done it. Yeah, there's some things we're going to try. We're obviously going to have a fallback. We don't want to overcomplicate things. Um, so the biggest thing we got to figure out is when it's going to be in September. We also want to make sure we're not stepping on anyone's toes, like what happened last weekend. We've got two shows 200 miles apart. So, so we'll work on that. Not yet. It's a lot of work. So we we prepared it. Yeah, here is some. And a mark. I guess the big question is, can we pull off that? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the one that goes. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to make sure we're doing it. We're doing it apart. So again, long as we do different dates, that's going to be one of the first. Well, again, September, October, we'll figure it out, but let's. Can I suggest that those of you who are aware or have become aware of when those dates are or when they might be coming up in a scale? I'll keep a running list so we have a That, that was my next point. Talking to the agent, and there. now that it's busy, you know, problem tightening up on COVID and stuff, yeah. it's pushing the activity. Yeah. And, and you basically just got to get on it. Like, yeah. Or I was there, the, the phone didn't stop. The phone didn't oh, yeah. Had to be yeah. So I think basically the first job of the committee will probably be by next meeting, nailing down. See if we can get the nailing down a date we want and also being able to go apart. Okay, that's awesome news, guys. Thank you for everyone for coming together. That'll be really, really good. I know the show is very popular among the province and the northwest U.S. So. We, may, we may want to, everybody may want to, not tonight, but start thinking about whether we want to have a thing or anything like that. Yeah. So, yeah we'll get some stuff together. Okay. Well, we're gonna have, we have some memorial awards. We have to make some plaques for them. So we'll, we'll still have that. Yeah. For the general theme, what's 2023 yeah. is an anniversary of what? Okay, on the tables. I want to move at a brisk pace because I know uh, we've got a very good airbrush. 
All right. Uh, there's some magazines here. I assume these are free for the taking. Yeah, after. Oh, oh shit. Next step. Next step. Covering it. All righty. All right. Who's next? I recognize. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. That's a 148 scale scooter style house made out of uh, XPS home. I brought it to the last meeting, but now it's all finished. And if you peer closely in those windows, you'll see uh, uh, some lighting that I did. I put a fireplace in it in the bottom and just some lighting in the top. But it's very dim unless you've got, of course, the lights off in the room or something. And next to it is the little gray thing. That's a calibration piece that you use on the 3D printer to uh, <coughs> you know, get your, uh, your exposure times and, this kind of thing. And but it's an interesting little piece because you can see just the amount of detail that that printer can print. And then next to it is a little Halloween diorama that I did for a little bit of fun. And it's a 3D printed monster pumpkin with a whole bunch of other 3D printed pumpkins around it. And it's a you pick if you dare go in there. <laughs> That's it for that. Yeah. We don't want to know. We don't want to know. Far, far too busy in there. Okay, Mr. Fay. What have you got there? Okay, the dilapidated model on the table is the Hasegawa 172nd scale Centrati Revolt Battle Pod that they came out with at the end of last year, was right at the beginning of the end of last year. Uh, compared to the old original kits, it's a million times better. Um, unfortunately, there were some fit problems. The um, and if you want to get fit properly, get rid of the seams that shouldn't be there. You're going to want to build the main hall together and then paint it afterwards. And when I finally finished it, I started noticing a little problem and its joints and the legs are definitely weak. So I'm going to have to do something about that. I'll probably put that one on the stand and figure it out for them. For the light missile version that's coming. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it, it was nice. Kit details, great. Do another versions of it. The uh, the decals went on perfectly, and they actually give you the alphabet and all the symbols so you can actually put on any division that you want which could be disastrous depending on what you put on it. And most people won't know what you put on it. Is this one of the back boxes? Yep. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I have three things here. The littlest. Yeah, three things. The littlest one is a 172nd scale uh, BD5J, uh, which is a home built kit jet from the 1970s. That, when I was young and taking my pilot's license, was the plane I wanted to build for myself and never got around to doing it because I university cost all my money. Um, but it was also famously flown in the James Bond film uh, Octopussy, flying through the, uh, the uh, uh, hangar. Anyway, it's kind of a fun little thing. It was a pallet cleanser, a simple little plane, and it's tiny. And I just brought it in because it's so freaking tiny. Kind of fun to look at. The, uh, the, the tanky thing is a, it's a mini art 
I don't even know if it's a paper Panzer. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's basically, it's a, a heavy tank with a V1 launcher on it, which would never actually work because the V1 needed some kind of length to get uh, off the ground. <laughs> but so I just played with that more than anything. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's no actual way to mount the V1 on the launcher. So it's stuck there with blue tack. And the, uh, the third one is a, a Hobbycraft 132nd scale uh, P51 1A uh, photo recon Mustang that uh, was painted in uh, an experimental dazzle camouflage in, in World War II. Uh, they figured if they it worked on ships in World War I, maybe they'd work on planes and all it didn't. And so they only did it, did it on this one. Um, but this was kind of a, a, a cheesy kit that I got in a, a series of, uh, in a Revell P-51 132nd scale box with three Mustangs in it. And this was one of them was missing a few parts. And I thought, well, I'll just play around with it and see what I could do with it. And that scheme caught my eye as being a bit of a challenge. So this was supposed to be a, a painting exercise to practice painting. And that's what it turned out to be. So I'm kind of pleased with it. Uh, it actually is a striking model. Um, if you look you don't have to look very closely to realize just how badly I painted the national insignia <laughs> uh, based on Duncan, Duncan's prodding at the last time I was at one of these meetings. He suggested how easy it was to paint these things. It's easy if you buy the mask for it. It's not so easy. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> the quality of my work is entirely your fault, Duncan. Yeah. But I actually tried to cut it because I didn't want to wait to have it delivered. So I tried to cut it myself with a circle cutter and then doing the math to figure out five, five pointed stars. It, don't do it that way. Buy the damn mask. It's a lot easier. So that's, that's what, that's what that is. Oh, All right. Okay. Chinook. Yes, of course. Perfect. Thank you guys for bringing the kit for the, uh, you know, in, uh, more of the Saskatchewan free nation. Uh, I've got some stuff at home that I'm going to pack up and, Four weeks in and be in the post today. And yes, that's my matchbox snook. Talking it right there, spread leg as if it's going for a pee because I might cock up and bring the four in. And then I, when I realized I'd made that mistake, I said, oh, no problem. I come to the gear and I'll just spin the gear and never see it anyway. Installed the gear, set it down, and went, oh, yeah. By that time, it was all dry. And said, ah. So it's just going to sit on the shelf anyway. And the, uh, Decals, I did not want the brilliant bright markings that obviously many decal sheets come with. So I shot it with two coats of uh, flat. And I think that is, led to the uh, silvering. I tried several different types of uh, softeners to decrease that as I would work. So again, that's a lesson learned. One coat more than enough. And then put more coats on when it's on model. Uh, after doing some research and asking some of my daft questions, I found that the top of the props weren't actually painted gray. They just turned gray rather quickly through bleaching of the sun. So I missed it on several coats of gray. If you look on the other side, it's nice and black. I'm taking some things from Frank here. I got an overall light gray wash on the whole model of the thing to knock it down a bit. Didn't necessarily want to dirty it up because it was never in, in a wartime situation. These were definitely hard work. And there you go. Nice little one second second RCF. Um, that is the uh, Airfix P40B uh, kit came out a few years ago. Uh, Everybody was commenting on the shape of it and what they liked and didn't like about it. I think Airfix did a really nice job on it, even though they had some rather weird choices to break down the parts. Um, I tried to keep it to the minimum. Uh, I learned my lesson. I didn't paint the markings on this one. I used deco. <laughs> Jeff, just a <laughs> shout out to you there. <laughs> but uh, I actually, I, I liked the, the markings. This is a Barracuda Cal sheet that was out of production. And I was able to find it. And if you look at the side, it looks like the Pontiac logo in the early 40s that was uh, they put on the side of the airplanes. And the British called it a tomahawk. So there might be some sort of connection there. But this is uh, the famous 112 squadron. When they first got their airplanes, they were painted in the uh, uh, 
dark earth and green uh, color scheme of the early 1940 period. Uh, so it was kind of fun to try that out rather than the uh, sand and uh, midstone of the desert scheme. Um, I tried using blue tack on this one for the first time to do the camouflage scheme. So I made little snakes of blue tack and laid them on the wing to get a nice. Well, it all depends. Like you can use it on your, what I do is I made a thin one and then you can cut pieces of paper or tape and you just back onto the back of it. So, yeah. yeah. So, and if you lay the paper a little bit over, it's not too bad because you can get a, a more of a feathered edge if you spray down on the paper. There's a little bit of an overhang. Sorry, I, I'm doing promotion for later this evening's uh, thing. I'm hoping to learn some uh, airbrushing tips and technique. <laughs> anyway, uh, I very much like building this kit. This was one of my early COVID builds. Uh, I, uh, I kept the aftermarket to a minimum. Uh, my Scott's heritage came to the forefront and the flat tires, I added another layer of plastic to the bottom to make them less flat. And uh, sadly, I bought an Ultracast spinner and propeller and the spinner was not round. It was oval shaped and it just ruined the whole front of the airplane. So I used the propellers from the Ultracast set and then to get the spinner sharper, I just cut the end of it off and I glued a chunk of plastic onto the front and then shaped it to get a nice point out. Uh, anyway, nice kit, I would recommend it. It's uh, not too difficult to build. And, uh, it's just air fix in their wonky plastic that they have. Who's uh, the next? Oh yeah. And hello everybody up on Zoom there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next two things on the table are mine. The first one is uh, it's a kit by Ming or Mung, I guess it's pronounced actually. Um, I'm gonna look. I looked on Scale Me to get the name proper. It's, it's a Japanese paper project for a ramjet fighter. It was the uh, Kayaba Ku4 Katsuo Dori, is what it was called, and uh, it was a neat little kit. Um, it was beautiful. It was the first Ming kit I ever tried building. And it's just the fit was astounding. When you glue the wings on, they fit like in a weird part of the up high on the fuselage, but they sit perfectly, like perfectly straight when you install them. Um, there were two kits in the box. I traded one away uh, to somebody else when I first got the kit. I got the kit when it first came out in 2011. It got to a certain point and then it ended up going in a box because of the paint scheme on there. So I decided to do this tiger stripe paint scheme and I wanted to freehand it with the airbrush. And I tested uh, or Practiced multiple times and couldn't seem to do it. So I put the kit in the box and, you know, 10 years later, over the course of the pandemic, I decided to take it out and finish it up. I had some different airbrushes that allowed me to uh, get away with doing that paint scheme that's on there. So I finished it up. It came with a little cart that it sits on. I didn't like the cart. It was uh, all styrene, of course. So I uh, scratched it one out of a little stick of wood that I had um, that came out of actually, um, uh, I forgot the guy's name. The guy used to always bring magazines to the club. Walter, Walter Warren's collection. So when there was a sale at the show, I got a giant graduated cylinder with like three pounds of scale wood in it, and lumber and stuff. So I used a little bit of that stuff to build the uh, little cart it's sitting on. Um, next to that, oh, and the machine guns on there are some aftermarket machine guns or something I got from Ed Kubiak years ago from the barrel store. And uh, I think they're machine guns for some kind of a tiger tank or something, but I thought it looked cool. So. It's got these giant overscaled machine guns on there now for destroying bombers. Where does the ammunition go? Eh, who knows, right? So <laughs> anyways, um, and then next to that is uh, my Russian SU-57. Um, I bought this kit when it first came out and it was called the Pac FA-50, I think is what was the original NATO designation for it. But now of course it's the SU-57. And uh, again, I started this years ago. And then something got dropped on it, I think, and one of the vertical stabilizers got snapped off. So it went in the box. And uh, that was maybe, you know, eight or nine years ago. And then over the course of the pandemic, I decided I wanted to finish it. So I got it out and did it up. And this is what's called the shark paint scheme. Um, it was the second prototype the Russians built to this aircraft. Um, and they painted it like that. Um, what happened was there was an engine fire and the plane was basically, they considered it destroyed, but they did completely rebuild it and give it a new paint scheme. So. Parts of this aircraft are flying today with that weird digital camouflage they have on them now. But I like this paint scheme because it was on it for only a few months and I thought it looked kind of neat. So um, I used all Gunsy lacquers for that paint scheme and the engines were a lot of masking and different metalizer paints. And then to get the 
the sort of faded look on the top. Um, after I painted it, I took a, a rolled up um, like sanding sponge or like a micro mesh, and I carefully like rubbed through the one layer of paint so it had that kind of worn look like the real aircraft. Um, so that one uh, actually went to Heritage Con with me, and I think I got a second place in modern fighter planes or something like that. So um, on a personal note, I love this aircraft. I think it's gorgeous. Um, if anybody saw the new Maverick movie, you get to see it in action. And that was probably the best part of the whole movie for me was seeing this aircraft in action. So it was uh, it was pretty cool. So yeah, that's uh, that's that. I know. That's not about the plane, it's about the pilot, right? Uh, before we take a break, does anyone else have any news, views, comments, announcements? Nothing? Oh, I know. Yeah, there we go. Yes, yeah, now he's got the money. Yeah. And I brought some more of these little uh, little organizers for the event. So, this side of the picture here. Stuff like that. And I've got a couple of the. Floppy's 3D Printing Emporium. All rights reserved. Yeah. All right. Well, we're well ahead of time. So we'll take about a. Does everybody know that the 50 50? Yes. We not only will have 50 50 cash, but. But wait, there's more. Never oh. used. Thing will be there, and we'll also have a couple of books. Oh, so there's three different prizes. <laughs> so make there sure you go. get your tickets. Yeah, one for one, three for two, nine for five. Don't forget. We'll take about a George. How long do you reckon tonight? About half an hour. All right. We'll 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 take about a twenty to twenty-five minute break, and I'll call it to order when we're ready. Or the mini swap meet can continue. I'm just going to mute things for a while so I can save this microphone for the uh, demo. Thank you. Okay.
Go anywhere. I didn't get a ticket yet. Uh, All right. Don't quit. Give me one second. Why not? The rest of my money. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, five dollars. Oh, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, hmm. Money don't come my way. Secret safe enough. We never saw it. So, uh, 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 Okay, guys, here we go. Cash price for tonight is $39.50. So the first winner has a choice of either that or the other two prizes. I didn't buy a ticket, so I will draw. And the winning number is, it's a yellow ticket. 952-186. Anyone? Very good. Uh, Atta boy, come on over. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you wish the cash or what's behind door number two? Cash. Cash. <laughs> Here, I do ask that you can keep it down to a very quiet, dull roar. In other words, shut the beep up. Okay. Give me a, oh, <gasps> hang on. Can you put that on your lapel? So it'll clip right there. You just, Okay. All right, guys. I hope uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, uh, short story. Uh, about seven years ago, I lost my voice completely. No explanation. Experts couldn't figure it out. Therapy and some minor surgery, and this is what I'm stuck with. So I'm not soft-spoken by choice, but this is what I got. 
um, as somebody at work told me, jerk that he was, he said, everybody gets so many words to speak in their life. I've used all mine. Anyway. No. <laughs> anyway, um, what we're going to do is spend some time on airbrushing uh, today. Just some thoughts and ideas and, and things that I've learned over the years. Um, who doesn't airbrush here tonight? Is everybody's been airbrushing for a while? Okay, that's good. I can talk less. Um, basically, um, with airbrushes, I mean, everybody's got their own favorite. You know, there's the old, you know, Pash, uh, you know, siphon type, no movement, just press it, make air, adjust for paint. This was my first airbrush when I was like 20 something. Um, I moved up to a patch uh, uh, dual action, and I think you're familiar with that. It's still a siphon, bringing in paint from the bottom, then pushing on the trigger, airflow, and then pushing the trigger back increases uh, the paint flow onto your model. It takes a little practice getting this right because it is sort of two motions with one finger, but I think most people probably enjoy doing it that way then uh, because of the greater control you get. I like this workhorse because it's much easier to clean than some of the, the gravity feeds, which have smaller components. This thing comes apart. It's kind of like uh, I'm now the military guy that can strip the M15 uh, at nighttime in the dark with my eyes closed because uh, you know airbrushes last forever if they're kept clean. So you tear them down even between paint colors and uh, you never have problems with clogging and sputtering and stuff. That and taking good care of them so you don't bend the needle or bend the nozzle, although they're not expensive to, uh, to replace. Um, I'm not gonna go into compressors. Everybody's got their favorites. I just use a little patch with a, uh, a reservoir tank. I used to use just the compressor, but it was always, always, always running all the time. And then you'd see the pressure fluctuate and you, you could see it in the paint flow that the pressure was dropping. So I, I upgraded and got this small little reservoir tank. And I don't see the pressure drops that I used to. Uh, I put um, a, uh, a moisture, second moisture trap on that I found at a hobby store that you can uh, quickly drain the water out of. So this, is, this helps a lot in the summer when you're painting in the humidity and you get that water spray, which is murder. Uh, so this helps a lot in, in keeping that uh, under control. Uh, I do primarily 172 aircraft at this point, and I like it because of all the camouflage ideas that are there. Some are easy, some are really challenging. So I'm going to show uh, one camouflage set of ideas here that I found successful and I've been having some fun with. Um, this is an old uh, Airfix uh, uh, Whitley, Whitney that I'm going to use for today. Um, I like masking because I just, I don't, I, my hand is not as steady as it used to be to do the fine, fine uh, work that you need to do with uh, uh, freehand. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes I'm totally, totally disappointed. So I try to mask as much as possible with the, uh, you know, 40s RAF stuff, bombers especially, uh, they basically used a, a, an earth brown and a deep green, RAF deep green on the top, and oftentimes used black on the bottom. I've done this up to show two different ways of painting. The first is simply doing a primer coat. I use uh, Tamiya primer. I know some people use the primer in the spray can. I've learned that this is the same stuff as in the spray can. And uh, a, a bottle goes a long way, especially with this scale, especially because you're gonna be thinning it out with the Tamiya lacquer thinner while doing uh, the priming. Uh, so this is simply going with the primer coat and then using my brush as best I can. I do in the panel lines with either black or a NATO black color or an ad on the areas that would have normally seen a lot of walking or maintenance work, 
put in some squiggles and some blotches just to give it some interest in that area. The next step there would be to mask it and do multiple light coats of the green. The object here is to build up the green very gradually so that I don't make all the black disappear and I get kind of a marbled, worn effect. Because if you look at the photographs from the time, you know, the colors, there was all different shades and tones to the color from sunlight, dirt, wear, oil, grease, um, and just friction from the air. On the other side, I've done uh, what I learned last week from Frank is uh, black, black basing, where you spray the entire surface either in black primer or prime and spray black. Uh, I've done this in natal black. I find the black too stark, too unrealistic. So I've gone with a natal black. And then using, uh, knowing that this is going to be painted green, I've gone with some very, very, very light tones of that green with a brown tea. And just basically spray different shapes and sizes of, uh, of splotches on that black surface. On the back, REF stuff is, you know, bombers are always black on the bottom. But black is a very, very boring color for an aircraft. It also, in, mod, in scale form, it usually doesn't look very realistic because it's not solid black. So in this case, I've done the natal black uh, after the primer and then used a variety of colors that I want to start see come through the paint. So I've used like a very, very, very whitened version of the NATO. I put in some blue in there and a little bit of brown to try and, you know, build up what they call, you know, what I call marbling into the base of the plane. Yes, sir. Yep, it's exactly what I do. You don't need to mix up very much paint to do that. Now, typically, you're going to be doing it across an entire wing section. Um, but yeah, you just need a little bit of paint to do that. So uh, when I do uh, masking, uh, Duncan, who stole my thunder, uh, <laughs> I do, I like using this blue tack idea. You can buy this LePage fun tack, it's the same stuff. Um, you can get this at like Walmart or, or uh, stationary stores, that type of thing. The good thing is it doesn't leave a mark. And I've only used it with Tamiya paint. But when you peel it off, it does not leave any residue. It doesn't change the color. It's, it's really great in that regard. I basically make it into little worms. To do that, I take a little bit of the uh, blue tack. This is a piece of sheet plastic off an old sign. And I just uh, put it on my uh, desk and just start working at it. And just pressuring and pressuring, just keep rolling it under my plastic until I get the size of worm that I want. And then you can cut it into different sizes uh, as you need to. Uh, I think David is selling these for $5. <laughs> 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 All right. So I basically, uh, for masking, I simply take the instruction sheet, I blow it up in the photocopier. Typically, it goes like 165, 200. Usually, does the job. Cut it out as neatly as I can, and then affix it. Oops. Yeah. Next one. <laughs> that's the good thing about these yeah. the, the the bigger compressor that I, probably a lot of you use bigger storage tanks a lot more better air pressure and control but they're loud as sin this is great i can work in my office or downstairs and you know nobody gets bothered so the idea of using the um the blue tack, and you can also use rolls of uh, masking tape, but this is much more consistent in size than masking tape, is it raises the mask above the surface. Yes, sir. I just use scissors, especially with a round 
uh, camouflage like this, the knife, you're going to get sharp corners. So you just take a really sharp pair of scissors and just gently just, you know, go through those curves. You get a much smoother finish on there. If it's a, um, uh, like a more of a Luftwaffe hard pattern, then yeah, you can just use, I just will go with masking tape or a Tamiya masking tape and mask those hard camouflage lines. Um, so the idea is that by this sitting above the surface, when you spray down on it, it won't leave a hard line, depending how far away you are, how light your coats are. If you start getting onto an angle, it'll spray under the mask and you lose the shape of your camouflage. If you go with bigger rolls, you'll get a softer line. So depending on the scale, like because there's only 172, um, a, tight, a tighter line works for the scale. Something much larger, you may end up doing freehand to make it more realistic or use bigger wormies to get more distance from the surface. Pardon me? Yeah. I needed the space. <laughs> um, I've pre-mixed my, my green tonight uh, to use in the airbrush. Um, I primarily use Timea paints. I mix, uh, and this is a trick I learned from a hobby shop owner. Uh, I was mixing the Timea acrylics with their thinner. I now mix it 50-50 with their lacquer thinner. It gives a, um, a smoother finish and somewhat harder finish. And I'm really happy with, uh, with how that works. Uh, just their standard. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah, now there's two, the Timmy has two kinds of lacquer. They have their newest lacquer thinner for their LP lacquer paints. Don't use that. Don't turn this into gum. Uh, this is the lacquer thinner that they use for all their spray kings and for their primer. So if you mix it about 50-50 with your paint, you get a nice finish. And it mixes very, very well. Yeah, I guess it would be. I guess it would be. I forgot a tool here. I thought I had a little paintbrush to stir this way. Oh well. You want to... I got this. I'll try this. Right. Yeah. Should be fine. This is my uh, cheap Walmart paper towels. It's great because it's super thin. And for cleaning airbrushes, you can twist it into really, really, really thin, thin needle shapes, which will go right up the whole barrel with lacquer thinner on it. You can just ram it right up the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to edit this later, right? Frank, I'm sure your daughter can get some cap. I'm sure your daughter can get some cap. I say you need to shove it up. <laughs> the side roller eye. Yeah, I buy these at uh, uh, at Steve's place. Exactly. Yeah, it's an old it's an old to me a job. Yeah, but they're you can buy them brand new. They're like yeah. a buck something each. So they're terrific for uh, if I custom mix a color, I can keep it here and it seals tight so I can do touch up later. And still know I'm painting with the same color again. So 
To do the green again, I'm just going to go over the first example, the gray primer with the black and just gently, gently build up layers by spraying straight down onto the, uh, onto the model. Sometimes I'll go heavier over the black to cover it up a little faster. No, it goes on pretty dry. Again, everybody's got their own distance. You know, too close, it goes runny. Too far, it dries and leaves a pebbly finish. So it's like that experience thing. You know, it's it's half art, half skill, half experience. I run on the I run this at about ten to fifteen for most of this. And then I've just used the, the pullback feature on the airbrush to control my paint flow. So that's, I'm gonna do that with the gray. Now I'm gonna go back and do the same color on the other wing where I've done the black basing. And again, this is all about just eye and, and what looks right to you, you know, in terms of how much marbling you leave in there. What's your, um, kind of... I don't, I, I don't have a ratio. I basically go with the old adage, if it, if it flows like 2% milk in the cup, then that's good for me. And then depending if I'm doing fine work or not, I may thin it out a bit more, lower the pressure. So there's the two <coughs> versions. I'm not sure how well you can see it from there, but you can see the black base version. We have a bit more uh, interest a bit more interest in there. Now the next the next step we're going to do to finish off the uh, the first example is I'm going to add a lighter color to my green. Uh, with green, I found that adding white to light the green for shading looks funny. So I have tried using uh, this to me a flesh color. It's yellow, but it's got enough of a brown tone to it to make green interesting in a uh, appreciate scenario. So I'll add some of that to my green. I'll add a little bit of uh, thinner to that and a bit of the lacquer thing as well. And I just, just use handy dandy droppers for that. So I can count out, you know, how many uh, work for me. And then again, <laughs> it's just about eyeballing it, and deciding, you know, how much lighter do I want that pre-shade to be? Then I can just test it in the jar. If it flows the way I want it to, I'm happy. If not, I'll add a bit more thinner. I haven't found that, but I have read that it's a sin to mix it in the cup. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I'm using a gravity, if I'm using the gravity cup brush, I won't mix it in here because the paint just leaks down and your first shots are all the wrong color. 
But with this, you can get a good mix going. And it's just a little faster than transferring it and losing paint. <laughs> yeah, I do. Well, uh, this I bought a few years ago. It's really handy to blow out and clean stuff and to keep the air a little cleaner and hopefully saves my lungs. Are you using acrylics? Yeah. Uh, probably uh, it could be tip dry. Where some acrylic paints dry very quickly, either because of lower air volume, and they dry on the tip. Uh, I haven't found a solution other than to keep a, uh, uh, a Q-tip handy with thinner on it and just gently wipe it off. Uh, wow. Paint retarder works too. Like Tamiya makes a paint retarder. I find uh, Valero model color. They are terrible for tip dry. But if I add two or three drops of their flow improver, I find the tip dry is minimized a bit. That's the only way I can, I can reverse the layout by that. So now with this section, I'm going to basically do more shading. Having lightened up that green color, uh, I'm going to spray into that area straight on again. And just with random patterns, build up the color gradually. Again, just to build up some interest in that green. So you start to see, you know, a little bit of sun fading, that type of thing. Again, other colors could be used. And then uh, final weathering, whether it's oils or pastels, will really start to make that change. You. Sorry for shifting. Right. Yes, exactly. With the brown that I've already painted, yeah, the same idea. I, it didn't work out quite as well, but I would typically have put on like a lighter coat to bring up that sun fading as well. So that's the you know RAF green look. I take the mass off, you can see the very, very subtle outline on the, uh, where, the where the tape raised or the, the wormies raised it up. And then that can be either touched up, uh, but typically the best shot is the first time you go through it. That's your best success. Oh. Pardon me? Sometimes I'll put the mask back on or I will cheat and take the wormy off and I will gently put the worm around the shape and just gently spray the area that I'm not happy with. And this prevents it from going beyond the area. The next thing I want to do, how am I for time? Okay, now I want to do black. Um, as I mentioned before, black is, uh, is an odd, odd color to work with um, because it never really looks realistic. Um, I'm sure most of you guys do this already with acrylics for cleaning and quick cleanups for brushes. I use window wash for your car. The alcohol content. Uh, it, it's, it will eat the, uh, the coating. You have a high-end airbrush with a nipple coating. The wind coating. Ah. It will also eat the seals in your airbrush. Which side were you on? So I was on the anti I used the technology. 
Yeah. I mean, I have have probably, is it coming on? Yes. I, can, I used to on my hard drive. Oh, that's a good back. idea. I've used uh, uh, yeah. these as well. All the inside Pipe cleaners cut to size. Down the oh. it, and just so give it a brush off yeah, to get any just, loose lint. And then it just scoots right down in there from, and cleans that area. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pure. That's just pure Canadian tire lacquer thinner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reality of that. And I and don't breathe for free too much. I didn't bring it with me, but you know, I'm sure we all wear a mask when we uh, do oh, this, yeah. and we have air boo air booze and stuff. <laughs> No, no, but I yeah, because I have one of those. Books, I wonder if I can that, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is yeah. so the next. So the next uh, demo, if you will, is I'm going to work with black uh, on the base of this. As I said before, I you know pre coated appreciated with black. I've done the center panels with various shades of really light, light gray or some blue. And then I've mixed up NATO black, or sorry, flat, just basic to me a flat black with red brown. It takes away the starkness of the black, gives a bit of a dirty tone. And depending on how you know translucent you put it on, it can make for more interesting black, especially for these REF bombers. So with this, I'll probably try to st stay in the center panels leaving the, uh, the panel lines more the original black color. Something I didn't point out, I tried something different today. On the rib ailerons, I sprayed them a very, very light gray and then masked them with tape to leave white stripes and then hit that with the black base and now when I spray over it, hopefully I'll get a little bit of that uh, lighter color showing through to highlight the rib rays. Yeah, it's uh, World War One stuff, yeah. So when you see the video, yeah, when you get off the projector, it's very subtle. So you know you can keep working at this, at you know, to get the the look you want. And that's kind of the idea. Um, I like I like doing this because I get such a variety of color into the uh, into the plane, and when it's done really well on the top, uh, you can see how that green picks up so many different. Uh, shades and and look. I'll when finished painting, I'll uh, basically gloss varnish, let that dry for a couple of days, 
and then I'll decal the last varnish again, and then it's time for the fun stuff, which is decals, and uh, uh, and then uh, go with sorry not that go with the uh, oil wash. I like using the oil washes, um, different colors, different shades, different pin washes and panels, and just try to dirty it up a little bit. Um, to me, it's a lot more fun. It's great to do a pristine model. I mean, they're beautiful. And I love looking at the internet and seeing these pieces. But me personally, I, I like them dirty. <laughs> I like them dirty. Um, I'll take off the mask. And again, you can see you know, how that subtly uh, butts up against the brown color where it's not you know, a hard, hard line. Uh, which I know you can't see from there. And that is uh, some of the things I wanted to show today. Uh, for some of, we were talking about spray booths. Uh, I bought one in Mississauga, um, and some of you may already have it. It's, it's like literally a box with a handle on it, and then it unfolds. It's got a built-in fan, has a built-in light, and then has this great uh, a corrugated extension tube and at the end of it is a flat panel that you open up the window a little bit, like an inch and a half, and stick the flat panel in the open window, and you're, you're blowing it outside uh, if you don't have you know, a fancy you know, exhaust system. So I thought that was a, a great deal for me because I don't have you know, access to that window right there uh, by the frame. Any questions or anything I can answer for anybody? I know some of this might have been repetitious, but yeah with this example yeah yeah yep so if you use those light light coats i don't know if you if you can see from here but you can see the panel lines in the black there now once you put in a wash that seeps into those panel lines then you really get the definition and the trick is to find the right color of wash if you do black, it, it just, it's too stark. It doesn't look real. But I'll mix up, depending on what my camouflage colors are, I'll use my, my oils and mix up a, a wash color that I like, usually with you know umber browns, some grays, black. Maybe I'll put some blue in, especially if it's a, a naval aircraft. I'll probably a little bit of a blue and gray and try to not make, make the panel lines there, but not make them jump at it. That help? Yeah, you're done. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of black with that works. Works for dark camouflage. <laughs> All right, any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention today, guys. So just so everyone knows, I believe next week, and Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, you were gonna do a demo of AK weathering pencils. Ooh. Excellent.
Oh, thank you. I'll take the mic. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of those figures when they went to position on the diorama, their helmet covers their face so much you can't see at all. It is probably the thing to do. Don't just think it's black. And then and they do that classical drop thing. That's what I was saying today. I I found an old Stuart, I can't hear anything. Basically, what it comes down to, what I find, is that do the eyes black and then they do a shade color on the cheek, right? Highlight the top of the nose, the top of the cheek. A new look, the forty six. No, no, I was thinking like the actual tail. Thank you. 